We started with a handful of schools and communities in Northern California. People visited these schools and saw my magic happening. They said, we want to be more like that, where students love what they're doing. So folks will ask me, like, what, what do we do? How do we start? How do we transform our school? It was different in a good way. They actually want to get to know you as a person. It's really nice to like feel heard and feel seen about what we want and what we care about. They were really trying to help me in my future. Before I came to the school, I was spending so much time stressing about the schoolwork. That regular school, they really don't care. They don't care about your interests. Here's a textbook, write it down, you'll be fine. My anxiety was critical. I didn't have hope for my own life. It can be really, really stressful, especially when you fall behind. I butted heads with every teacher I had, any counselor I had. I'd never thought they were actually trying to help. There wasn't a family. Everybody did their own things. They set me up for failure. I would get Fs, and I was just sick and tired of it. Traditional schooling teaches you how to work in a factory. It's industrial revolution teaching. In the year that Windsor Oaks Academy had the largest number of student graduates, it was the worst year that we had ever experienced. As a teacher, I was feeling very unfulfilled. Constantly dealing with a system that wasn't working for everybody. They had a packet system. There was uh, an aide who would like basically give them the answers so that they could write them on the packet and then they would turn in the packet and then they would get their credit. So they weren't learning anything. I didn't feel like what I had going on was inspiring at all. I uh, failed ninth grade at the other high school. I kind of lost track with regular schooling. I started falling further and further behind. So I just kind of gave up. Our new IT director came in. He says, hi, I'm Tim, how you doing? And I said, I'm doing terrible. <laughs> and I just unloaded on him. He said, you know, I just came from Idaho and we had this great school. It was a big picture learning school. I started looking for some alternative program that we could learn from and incorporate back at our school here. I worked in the Bay Area, some coworkers who worked with MetWest, which was the big picture school in Oakland. We started talking about the programs that they were doing, just really focusing on student interests and everything she said, I felt really aligned with where we were trying to head. She came in, she told us about Big Picture. We started uh, rolling out the, the ideas, talking to the staff, making sure they understood where we were going. It just seemed like a really good fit for what we were trying to achieve with our students, which is to have some promise and hope after they graduate. I didn't think about what other ways there were until Holly came and started talking about kids learning from what interests them. And it was like, oh my God, what a concept. Tim connected me with the principal in Idaho. We really started to get an idea of what the amount of work it takes to make this kind of change, but also the positive, great things that happen in the process. We said, you know, we're going to go to the board and see if the board will allow us to pursue this. I started talking to the superintendent, Becky Walker, she was looking at it sort of like it's a new math program. She slowly started to go, oh, big picture learning, this is a whole different way of education. The board approved a two-year pilot. The fall of that next year, we were a big picture school. Wow. <laughs> All of us, including me, didn't really know what we were doing. <laughs> and so we needed, we needed help. My role was to, to help folks understand how they wanted to be and figure out how to get there. We need to educate all of us, staff and the students, what is really being picture. We spent days and days in PD, professional development, because we wanted to. We actually had a series of trainings the final week of school, and I thought, this is going to go bad. How could I possibly have extra time and then go in the afternoon to have big picture training? I just found myself at the end of every training higher than when I got there. We said, here's our philosophy. Here's the end game. Here's what we want to do. We looked at what we do well, what we want to improve, where we wanted to be. Do you all do learning plans? Yeah. We envision five years from now, what is wild success? 
name specific examples of things that were happening five years from now. From there, we kind of developed a school learning plan. I just couldn't wrap my head around what a learning plan was going to be. Once I did my own, I was able to explain it better to the students. So it's not just us telling the kids what to do, but we are also doing the things that we are asking our students to do. So I want to kick off, um, you know, when I first encountered Big Picture back in 2005, uh, I went to Big Bang, and that was my first encounter with Big Picture. And I was highly critical of Big Picture learning. Um, and, I, and I, you know, I think I have a healthy <laughs> form of skepticism, um, but it, how I understood Big Picture back then is very different than how I understand it now. Um, I don't know who to start with. I saw Dana first. So Dana, um, I'll ask you first. And then if you could introduce yourself a little bit too, and then we'll give a chance to the other panelists. Miranda, who was in the film, is having a hard time with tech. So uh, Miranda's going to be dropping stuff into the chat. But Dana, um, I don't know if that resonates with you. And if you think back to when you first uh, encountered or discovered or came across Big Picture, um, what was your understanding like then? And maybe how has that shifted now? Hi, uh, I'm Dana Jones, and I'm an advisor and an LTI coordinator up at North Bay Met in Windsor, California. Uh, LTI is learning through interest, for those of you who don't know the lingo. Um, when Susan and I were sitting with Tim and we first heard about Big Picture, I was like, yes, finally. Um, and it's kind of been everything that I thought it was going to be. Um, my struggle was that I didn't understand why everybody didn't get it. Because for me, the heart of everything I do is around educating students and watching them excel through their own self discovery. And so this was perfect. And I went, okay, let's go for it. And then when we started talking to other people, and they were like, well, that sounds great. Oh, no, yeah, we can't do that. And oh, no, that's too hard. Or, you know, whatever. I was like, I just, there was a, probably a little anger or disappointment frustration with I you know if we're creating this program that's going to help students excel why wouldn't you be on board um so that was my biggest struggle I think um with the coming of big picture and me seeing this as as an educator as a tired educator this was lovely I got invigorated so that was that was a good thing if you want me to pass it off Lauren or that would be great okay so um, I, let's hear from Tony, because you came and you were having, he's also a student from North Bay Met, so I'll let you finish your introduction. So yeah, my name is Tony, my real name is Antonio. I joined North Bay Met back in 2019, I believe. Um, when I thought I had to write it down so I didn't forget. Definitely kind of what Lauren said, when I first saw Big Picture Learning and I heard about it, it was completely different from how I think of it now and when I left. When I joined, it was more so kind of a, this is where the bad kids go and this is where kids who give up go. It's not really like a good school. There's nothing to get out of it, but it's so much different than that. And I think that a lot of people need to understand our school and big picture learning because it's definitely beneficial to so many students. And I'm one of the things in the video that stuck with me the first time that I watched it was when I don't I think it was Zach says regular schools teaches you how to work in a factory. And that's so I think that hits home because at Big Picture Learning, it's the complete opposite. They teach you what you want to do and they teach you your interests. And I think that's amazing. That's why I love Big Picture, big picture Learning. Chris, what about you? Yeah, so, um, well, first off, just to get it off of my chest, you know, you guys all should know that I'm clinically diagnosed with being oppositionally defiant. So, like, that will start the whole stage there. Um, so, I was working at a continuation school because I wanted to work at a small school. I got a, gotten my master's, went back, and um, and I was really interested in finding something that would actually serve the kids. So, what I mean by that is, working in traditional education. And for those of you who work in traditional or conventional schools, I think we're not just missing the boat, we're actually damaging kids um, by not meeting them where they are. And um, there are so many kids, We I, I work in a school district that has about 80% free and reduced lunch. 
and we only talk about AP kids and how they're getting into four-year colleges. And so when I was working at the continuation school, um, where I was working only you know, with kids that were not going to go to college, we were trying to serve them the best we possibly could, and um, we were still failing. Um, and that was the problem. And so we thought, what can we do at our school that would actually help kids with life skills and give them purpose and some sort of uh, a promise that they can move out into the real world? <clears throat> and so when we were talking, we started dabbling with advisory and we started doing big picture esque kind of things on our own. But we were gonna, we knew we were going to get into trouble, which was not my concern, but we knew we were going to get into trouble. And so as you heard, Erica Gonzalez, my dean, who was on that film, she knew of somebody who went who worked at Met, uh, Met West uh, for years and she introduced me to them. And when they brought her when she brought her in and I listened to her, I said, yep, we're doing it and we're going to go all in. And that's when I reached out to Javier, who's in the um, in the chat down there and we talked and he said, yep, you look like you're going to work out just fine. And everything just aligned perfectly. He came up and visited us. I was willing to take the risks. And then he brought Lauren on and we just, we never looked back. The process of trying to get the whole staff along with me is a different conversation, but we knew we needed this. This is exactly what the kids needed. And, um, and nobody blinked an eye. So. Thanks, Chris. Um, and Miranda, uh, I, I know you're having troubles with, with audio, um, with tech, but if you do want to drop anything in the chat, please do. I also want to remind folks, as you have questions or stuff comes up, if you could drop it in the chat, um, we can address that. Uh, Dana, I want to go back to something you said um, about people saying that's too hard. Um, and I'm curious for, for all of you, um, when you first were discovering, you know, you know, starting your journey with big picture, what were some of the barriers? And I think you've already touched on this a little bit. What were some of the specific things when people said that's too hard or I don't want to do this? And Tony, um, I hear a lot from um, from young people and, you know, in, in new big picture schools or beginning their journey, they say, that, you know, just tell me what to do. Like, what are some of the barriers you encountered as you you started wading into big picture? Um, the biggest was, again, uh, well, I don't know, like I'm going, I'm looking at Emmanuel's question and it, it, and part of it is we get in our own way, um, you know, because we're like, oh, this is great, but how are we going to do this? How are we going to get attendance? How are we going to, um, you know, trust outside mentors or how are we going to get people to buy into it? And it's funny, like the parents bought into it because they just absolutely loved it because they love the idea of their student finally being understood. And so that was probably the easiest people to buy into it. And the hardest people were the ones attached to education because I think we're stuck in this like concrete mindset that you have to sit in a chair, you have to sit in front of me, I profess to you. You go, oh, that's fantastic. I've never heard that before. And then you write a bunch of notes and then you barf it back out on a test. And then I go, fantastic. You told me everything I told you, you're educated. And for me, that was like, like Tony was saying, and how Zach said, it was like, I was being institutionalized. And so the concept for me was like to be de-institutionalized. And for some of the educators that were with us when we first started, it was hard for them. They couldn't wrap their heads around it. They um, didn't trust, I think, the process or the students to take on their own educational journey. And that was kind of frustrating to me because you know, kids can do anything, right? It's as we get older, we have these barriers in our thinking and, you know, all that kind of good stuff. But it's like, if you let students run, then it'll, you'll be amazed at what they're capable of doing. And, but there was a lot of people that couldn't, and they're, sadly, they're no longer with the program because of the fact that they just didn't like the kind of loosey goosiness of the program or didn't trust the students, which, you know, I don't understand, but that's why I'm still here, right? Is that I trust the kids and I enjoy the process and I wanna be on their journey with them um, as opposed to me guiding their journey. And that's probably one of the biggest things is that big picture is very self-directed too. And that, is, that could be a challenge for a lot of students, like Lauren said, who wanna come over here and see, I just want you to tell me what to do um, because that's not, um, that's not what we do. Does that answer anybody's question? Any more questions? I appreciate that, Dana. Curious, Tony, Chris, any uh, barriers that you can remember or ran into and in, uh, when you were first kind of entering this journey? I think um, 
you know, I, just to be clear, um, the you saw myself, um, you saw Windsor kind of, you know, talking about the startup. The processes that we did were very different, and I want everyone to understand that. Um, um, Susan went out in Eistrom, who was a part of Windsor, who Dan is a part of, went and asked the board if she could do this. I did not do that. I literally just went for it and decided to ask for forgiveness later. And I want to make sure that you understand that because it's a very different process. So the barriers that I had for me were just, how do I keep this a secret as long as I possibly can with before it starts to get out, as opposed to the, the, you know, the, the change or the opposite of that. Um, so my barriers were just finding time to sit down with my staff and go through a process where we focused on students where we talked about why are you a teacher? Why are you in this profession? And when you start taking away layer after layer of this onion and you get down to the heart of it, no matter where you sit on a political spectrum or you know whatever, you all, all teachers are in this for the same reason, it's to serve the kids. It's not to get test scores, it's not to get A's and F's, it's literally to serve kids. And so at the end of the day, we talked about, are we serving our kids and everyone decided and made an agreement that we are not serving them and we got to do something different. And that's when I popped big picture on them. So that was the more the biggest barrier from my perspective. So it's very different between myself and what Windsor did. I really appreciate that. I think um, like the journeys in each school are different, right? Um, and, you know, in the film, knowing the context of some of the other schools, everybody, I think, approached this in different ways. There's some common barriers or some different barriers. Tony, it looks like you were about to jump in, and I think Anne's going to read what Miranda has shared as well. But Tony, it, look, it looks like you had something to say there. I I just wanted to say two things on both of what Dana said and what Chris said. I think what Dana said about trust from the student's perspective, it definitely helped a lot. And that's what made it so heartwarming and welcoming, because when you see that your teacher is trusting you to follow something that you are passionate about, it makes it even more genuine, even more like a, I want to do this so much more and I want to continue this and this is my future career. And something that I believe Chris said was the converting of it from student perspective. It definitely is a little groovy going from packets and whatnot to wanting to do what you want to do. And I, that's the two things that I wanted to comment on. And I also saw a question about, is this right for all kids? And I, I do believe there might be some people who are definitely built for the other schools, but for the most part, a lot of the people that I meet, I think they would have done so much more better if they went to big picture learning. Thanks, Tony. I'm going to share what Miranda said, just because I don't know if everyone can see the chat. And if you watch the whole film, you'll hear her beautiful voice and experience throughout. Um, but she said, I really appreciate big picture and the family we created there for sure saved my life and many others. So many beautiful success stories come from that program beyond grateful to have been able to experience the program. I never wanted to attend South Valley due to the stigma our school has slash had the bad kids school, the lazy kids, the druggy kids. Gratefully, the stigma in our school is changing. Our school saves lives. This program actually serves young people in our community. As students have said, really trying to help me and my future um, promise and hope after graduating. This program is powerful as being a fresh graduate. I see now where my peers are in life um, and life after graduation. All my peers that graduated from big picture don't feel lost. They feel confident in the direction they are going to where my friends who graduated from the traditional school feel so lost and overwhelmed. They have no sense of direction. They don't know their passions or interests or what they want to do with. And I think their life was the next part, but which I think is really beautiful. Um, and then she said, don't get me wrong. It's beyond okay to feel like that. But the thing is young people don't need to feel like that. Appreciate that. Which is beautiful. Tony. Um, if I could come back to you for a second, uh, Dana mentioned deinstitutionalizing. I've heard a lot of folks talk about the unlearning that comes with big picture and um, the unlearning of like, you know, I think of it as like unlearning a relationship with school. Um, maybe, maybe what are some of the things you had to unlearn, Tony? And, um, and or like, how did your relation, I, I think you touched on this, how did your relationship like, can, can you kind of contrast your relationship with school before you came to North Bay Met um, and how that relationship changed? Yeah, so uh, 
it, it was a little while ago so that's why I'm like trying to think of it um I think that the hardest thing about switching over was was from uh, other schools a traditional school you go in there and you're doing kind of one of the quotes on from Heather said in the video you're just doing a packet you know they're showing you something and you're in a group you're just copying off of others and that's that that was my interpretation of school that's how I got by and coasted by but you come to big picture learning and the barrier and like what was so hard is you're you're having to actually learn what you like you know and what you want to do with your future because they're at big picture learning they're just giving you what you need and they want to help and the rest of it is kind of up to you and up to the students to really engage with themselves and that's where the trust plays in for the teachers saying like come on you gotta you gotta understand what you like to do it my words are coming out so bad by the way Lauren I apologize great but, um yeah I I'm kind of a loss of words right now so I hope Miranda says something in the chat but <laughs> yeah, just, the unlearning of going to packets and just not really not really having a love for school because when I was at the other one it was okay well I'll just ditch my second class and go get McDonald's or I'll go to Kaiser Park and go hang out with my friends versus at North Bay it's like okay I know that they said I can continue what I wanted to at home but I'm excited to go to class because now I can sit at this room with other students who are all passionate either about the same thing or other things and they're all just uplifting each other and that's where from okay I can ditch class and it doesn't really matter to I want to go to school and I want to finish that project I started on last week. That's where my mind completely changed about school. And it was, I love school and not, I hate school and I could care less. That's why big picture saved me. And when Miranda read her quote, like I can relate 100% to what she says and she has a better way of saying her words. So that's why Miranda, something in the chat, come on. Sorry, don't sell yourself short. No, can, I, can I, can I add oh. something Lauren really quick? I'm sorry. I just, I've had the, as a, coach I've had the like great fortune at being at the beginning of this process with a lot of schools and honestly like the hardest part for everyone is definitely like the adults unlearning the kids kids would go there so fast and they're like oh I mean there's bumps in the road for them too I don't mean to to minimize that but it is the adult learning and unlearning process that's the hardest and when the adults can come together and really get behind this idea like that's and then the students like really see the beauty in it like there's such magic that happens and I I feel like Tony you're clearly expressing that Miranda Dana and Chris um, but I think that is the hardest part of all of it is the adult the adult unlearning and the structures that we are all acting within Chris you were going to say something though yeah I'll, I'll actually I'll speak to that a little bit you know I think what would help what's helped us um, alleviate some of that problem of unlearning with adults is to have the adults meet regularly. And I mean daily because they're supporting each other through that process and they're learning from each other saying, yeah, this is how we're doing. This is how we're doing it. If you just put a picture in and you let everybody try to figure it out on their own, it's going to go really slowly. I mean, much more slowly than meeting daily. So we built it into our school day where we meet every morning, literally every morning, which is kind of a rare thing for a lot of schools, but we just went to our board and we asked them to do that. So that's one thing. I, from our perspective, um, having the kids trust us that we're actually doing things for them um, and uh, that their unlearning was our biggest concern. Um, you know, allowing kids to sit and do nothing for a long period of time until they're ready to engage is harrowing for, for teachers. Um, we call them advisors, right? Um, and but they almost always come around. And Antonio, I think you were kind of alluding to that a little bit. I mean, in the sense that, you know, you get in there, you're like, what is this? Well, you're, you're about my interests, really? Like, and then it takes sometimes months, if not a year for a kid to actually engage in the process. Um, so, anyhow. Can, I'm sorry, Lauren, can I actually comment on that really quick, Chris? Um, when I like exactly what you just said, it took a couple weeks, maybe months, and I was just in the program still kind of adjusting to it. And it wasn't until I, I think it was maybe in Dana's room that there was the upcoming LTIs and come on a field trip and just see what it is about. And uh, I one of my friends encouraged me to go and then she backed out later on. But it was it was eye opening and it was awesome that I found something that I was passionate about and it helped me got me going in the correct direction. So uh, I, that's what I was saying. It took me a couple months and it's kind of crazy because I'm adjusting from old school 
my head to this big picture learning. But once once the students get it, it's click and we're going. We want to go, and that's that was my favorite part about that. I appreciate that. Yeah, and don't apologize for jumping in. Um, <laughs> you know, if it, if it this sparks a discussion, that's fantastic. Uh, I wanted to shift just a little bit um, and shout out to some of the folks who are in our our Tybo cohort. Uh, Tybo stands TYBO stands for the year before opening. Um, so we've got some folks uh, who you know go through uh, transitioning a school, which is what North Bay Med and, and South Valley did, right? Big picture, Ukiah. Um, we also have some folks that get the chance to start a school from scratch, um, you know, or, or 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 open a school, which is what we did in Highline 2005. The school was non-existent. We started it. Uh, what do you what do you if you were in that place where you could start it from scratch, right? How like what are some things that you would you know early stage? What are some things that you would prioritize? And and this is for everybody, right? Tony, don't apologize for jumping in. But, but I have a but I have a thing to jump in on for all the people that are are ready to get on board. Is how so North Bay Med is brand new. Um, Windsor Oaks was the school that mm. we did the study, and that's who Javier and um, Jeff Petty came to evaluate. And then we created North Bay Met. And starting a new school is not as easy as you think it is. Well, it's not as hard as you think it is. Um, but one of the main things is that we categorized our school with the state in a manner that allowed us to capture attendance, but also allowed the flexibility of the students getting out. And we categorized ourselves as an independent study school. And so that's something for you guys to think about is that if you don't want to have a, a you know, transfer, transfer your continuation school into that, or, or you don't have a, you know, like a charter school type of coding on your school or something like that independent study is also allows you a greater flexibility in establishing a school. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, the only thing I'll say is if you want something to drive a conversation to bring everyone on board, learn what ACEs are adverse childhood experiences that alone was able to, I was able to convince almost every single one of my staff members by just talking about it. When you can, when you have a conversation with a staff members or people who are kind of on the edge of like, Oh, what is this? And you say, you talk to them about how past experiences led to the behaviors of our kids. And it's not their fault that they're acting this way. Um, it, 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 it's a, it's a game changer for so many of my, my, my staff members and the people in the community. Um, I use it all the time. And it was what literally changed my, my view of it all. So if I had to start anywhere, I would start with that and say, look, if this is true, if this, this data is true and there are, kids are coming from this much trauma we've got to do something it is imperative it, it's an unethical to to not look at um, our kids for who they are and what they're coming from and so that conversation sparked everything moving forward and yes there's a lot of devil in the details stuff but I, I would start there I'm going to read another response from Miranda. She says, young people are so beyond powerful. Adults at BPL show us and build our confidence to even use our power and step out of our comfort zone. Bring us family that not all of us have. Even after graduation, they are still always willing to help out with whatever we need. BPL prepares us, us young people for real life, supports us, hears us, sees us, even when we don't see ourselves. Build confidence in us. Help us young people find who we are. Adults, who are there because they actually care and want to make a difference for us young people, not there just because they work there. The positive, encouraging adults help the youth thrive. It is so beyond beautiful to see the youth light up and begin to gain self-confidence within oneself. Beautiful. Yeah, just to chime in on that, um, one of the things that we do is in our advisory structure um, at the school is that we have different activities that we participate in. We have little ice breaking activities and then we have a big activity. And yesterday was my advisory's turn. We went to a climbing gym. And I had a student in my class who came to us and probably cried the first three weeks of school um, and was like a silent crier. So I'm you know, in the front of the class talking to them and she's sitting next to me and just sobbing silently. And it was horrible to watch, but she was just so anxious and so anxiety ridden and everything else. And that was in August. Yesterday, that 
child ran up and down the wall like n nothing could stop her and you know I was teasing her and saying that she had squirrel DNA because I've never seen anybody climb so quickly and I asked her if she knew that that was if she had that in her and she had no idea but because being at her schools allowed her to come out of her shell on her timeline that is why she has the confidence that she has now if I can get her to speak louder than a whisper then we're going to be good but right now I mean, you know, you need somebody to climb something, she's on it. So I just want you guys to understand that, you know, like Chris said, sometimes it takes time. And it's, again, going back to the trust, you have to trust a student to be able to unravel and undo the layers on their own timeline and not try to force it. Because unfortunately, when you're forcing it, you're kind of re-traumatizing them as well. And a lot of our students, as well as having high ACEs scores, also have like, and I don't even know what you'd call it. They have, you know, trauma from school, um, you know, uh, things that teachers have told them and, and things that have stuck with them from kindergarten and saying how they felt unseen or they were told they would never amount to anything. And, um, you know, as an advisor, that's part of my job is that I have to undo all that. I have to undo all that damage and, you know, basically say like, you're not what they told you you are, you're so much better. And so advisor, I love it because of the um, the aspect of, you know, I'm advising, right? So I'm going along the journey with you. I'm not leading you on the journey. I'm just, you know, we're going together. So anyway, that's that. Appreciate that. You know, um, this next question, I wanna kick off to Tony again first. Um, Chris mentioned, mentioned something about staff meeting every day. And Javier, I think seconded that, um, the importance of, um, you know, constantly, to me, the way I make sense of it, constantly meeting, constantly adjusting, checking in with each other. I've also heard people say staff culture is the glass ceiling to student culture. Tony, um, from your observation when you were at North Bay Met, uh, how would you characterize the relationships of the adults at North Bay Met with each other? Um, I would say that they all seem very happy to work with each other. They seemed, the it sounds weird if the way I'm going to say it right now, but it was kind of like everybody was the parents of their own class and like they genuinely loved and saw each kid as their own and was not bragging, but, oh, well, my students are doing this and I'm so happy that my students go, oh, how did you get yours to, I can't get, you know, and just seeing that they cared about us helps and what Miranda was saying is it's uplifting it's encouraging it's showing us that we are more than what we perceived from other schools and that's that for me was the best part about it because I'm thinking I'm just like a regular student nobody really cares about me the teachers at the other schools are they don't get along you hear the drama about them but at Big Picture Learning it's such a small confined spot and it's so much love and when you see the staff members being happy and communicating, it just wants you to mimic that and mirror it. And that's where the students start being happy and sharing about their teachers and their advisors. And it's just, it's nice. I, sorry for saying teachers, it's, it's advisors, but I get it mixed up. I've got, I've got to respond to this too. Can I respond to this real quick, Lauren? Um, Miranda, and I don't know if you saw this when you were there, but our teachers basically hated each other. And they still like, I'm just telling you, and I want you guys all to know that because it, it, we can't stand each other. Um, but because our purpose was so clear and our trajectory about how we're hel helping kids was so understood and it was written into everything we're doing, we did, we do amazing work but we don't like each other at the end of the day and we meet daily and it is rough. It is very rough when I'm telling you all this, because you don't have to have this kumbaya experience at a school. If everyone's on the same page, right, you will get amazing work done. And so I just I needed to throw the counter <laughs> perspective on that. Well, I know it wasn't always rainbows and unicorns, North Bay Met staff either. Right. Um, but I, I think the like what we portray to young people is really important. And, and I appreciate what you shared, Tony. And, and it is different. Every school's journey is different. I think the last uh, kind of question um, kind of springing from that. I know when we started Highline back in 2005, uh, we had no freaking clue what we were doing. Um, we didn't have plans that um, we met as for the first time as a staff two weeks before the doors opened. 
Um, and, but we, we didn't know what we were doing, but we were super clear about why we were doing. And um, I'm curious if each of you maybe could conclude with, you know, what, what, what do you believe the purpose of, I want to, maybe there's two parts to this. What do you believe the purpose of school to be? Like what it should be, I should say. Um, what do you want the purpose of school to be? And what, what is the purpose of, what is, what is that why, Chris? What is, what is the purpose of North Bay Met of South Valley? If everybody could weigh in on that, I'd appreciate it. Um, when I had to go to finally go to the board and the community and tell them what we were doing, um, and we already had the community behind us because we were doing the stuff in the community. People were supporting us. They wouldn't know why, but they were supporting us. And I had to actually explain what we were doing. It was about trying to create a town. I, I live in a small town. Our school is about 15, our, our district is about 15,000 people, plus another 10,000 surrounding areas. We wanted to create a community where we knew that people could walk down the street and not be worried about the homeless and people stealing things and violence and drugs. And that the little thing that we were doing in our school was creating these kids that had purpose that could change the cycle or end the cycle of trauma, you know, from generation to generation. Um, it was holistic. It wasn't just like, yeah, we're looking at each individual kid and trying to make get them out and have something that they can look forward to. But the overall purpose was to create a community that was loving and peaceful to, and try to end poverty. I mean, let's be real. I know that's not technically possible in our current system, but that was our intention. And so with that mindset, that was how we got everybody on board. All right. Um, let's see. The purpose of schooling altogether uh, is socialization, right? Is that we learn how to get along with one another. We learn how to work with each other, right? All those kinds of people skills, which is kind of funny because the traditional model doesn't, I, it teaches some of that, but it's more um, focused on what you know or how much you know. And for us, our purpose at North Bay Met was really to um, empower the students. Um, like Susan said in the in the very beginning, when we had students graduate from our program uh, before BPL, um, you know we had a high graduation rate. Like the main high school would send kids to us because they they knew we can get the kids graduated. Um, but the problem was is that they were coming back ten years later and not having any kind of focus or idea where they were heading. And for us creating the schools because we wanted them to experience so many things before they left so that they weren't afraid to take chances after they graduated and that's what we're seeing with students like tony and max and you know plenty of our students who come back to visit us to check in and can you help me fill out this application or do this thing or you know whatever it is or even just come to love us up and let us know that they miss us you know we're i mean i guess the ultimate goal is to you know save kids and I appreciate that because, um, you know, I've seen, I've watched too many students pass away as a result of not having any focus. Um, I can't even tell you how many students from my first couple of years that I've lost. And it's ridiculous because, you know, that group is just all turning about 35 now. So um, the idea that we're doing something different and we're giving kids hope is uh, a better meaning for me. And it fulfills me definitely more as an educator than in the past. Tony, if I could ask, thanks, Dana. Appreciate that. And Tony, if I could ask you the same question, then we'll kick it back to Chris to bring us home. Um, well, I think the purpose of school is what Dana said as well, socializing. And on top of socializing, I think it comes down to getting ready for but your life, I guess you could say, what you want to pursue and what makes you happy and what you want to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think big picture learning not only helps with socializing versus other schools, because at big picture learning, it's a family. You're talking to everybody, you know, some versus at the other schools, maybe you wouldn't talk to your classmates that you have in big picture learning just because of the stigma around it and how that shapes your mind at the other schools. But um, also the second purpose that I mentioned about just knowing what you want to do and what you're going to spend the rest of your days happily smiling. 
I think big picture learning helps because that's their whole point. That's their whole motto. Get them what they like, get their passions rolling, help them, encourage them. And uh, something that I wanted to say as well was I know that there's a lot of students that go to big picture learning and they have A pluses and they're good and they're the best student, the best. But I just wanted to imagine if if there was one of the A plus students who's an AP honor roll their whole life at a normal school, I think if they were to come into big picture learning, they could like, I don't know, cure homelessness or something, because that's just the freedom that big picture learning gives them. And if they're already on top of everything else and they have all this extra time and they're crazy good at what they do, they could use the extra time on Tuesdays and Thursdays to go out and cause a project. I know somewhere in the video, there was something about helping the community and that absolutely blew my mind because I because for me, I just know that I didn't have that driving me to go above and beyond to the community. I don't remember which one it was. I think it was maybe Ukiah or, or Vallejo. I don't know. I don't know. But I just thought that was crazy. And I just think about the potential if students, as soon as students know what they're able to do and what they're capable, they're good to go and they can do it. So that's what I'm going to say on that about my purpose of school, just kids knowing what they want to do with the rest of their life and socializing. Thanks, Tony. Chris Jackson, I think, is going to bring us home in two seconds. Yeah, so there's a, there's a quote from Susan, I think, in the first section where somebody asks her how she's doing and she says some version of I'm doing terrible, right? <laughs> because I think it, one thing we've learned from this section of the video and also the discussion is like at the beginning, it's hard. And it doesn't tend to get any less hard as you move along. But spoiler alert, my favorite part of All In is the last 30 seconds of the video, which is like a montage of the young people, including Tony and Miranda, smiling and laughing. And to Chris's point, if you can get all the way to the young people, their joy, then you're heading in the right direction. So um, my job as chief communications officer is often advertising and plugging our services. So. I will lean into that and again, encourage folks to attend the rest of the series. Um, if you need the invitation, this link down at the bottom is the same for all webinars. So if you go to that, you'll be able to access the registration link. So two weeks from today on Thursday, March 9th, will be conversation two, connecting purpose with community. The link is case sensitive, but it's a bit.ly link, bit.ly slash BPL underscore all underscore in case sensitive. Two weeks after that, um, conversation three is going all in, the last part of our film focus conversation. And then in upon April 6th, and this is every other Thursday, we're gonna be talking with other leaders from across the board. Um, in just a moment in the chat, I'll drop a link to the all in resource guide. Um, it's a cumbersome link. So once I drop it, I encourage folks to click on it now so it comes up on your computer and have access to it. Um, and you heard men, you had low mention um, Big Bang early in this conversation <laughs> in various <laughs> in support of and not in support of. Uh, often you all should be the judge of whether Big Bang makes sense for you. But registration for Big Bang, our annual summer conference, is now open. If you go to bplevents.org, you can learn more about that. Um, it has been our pleasure to have you as part of this conversation. We hope to see you back. If you can't make it, uh, we are recording them. Um, I also want to extend an open invitation to Miranda. Miranda, would love to have you back for a future conversation where we can help you work on your tech because I want to hear your voice. Um, thanks, folks. Let me uh, drop that link in the chat so you have it. And um, there it is. Um, Dana, Chris, Miranda, Tony, Lauren, and really appreciate you all. Have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Go all in. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks for listening. Boom. Mm -hmm.